Um, do we know how many we have shot? Uh, possibly four. We got one shot in the head. We got three shot in the leg. One shot in the head, three shot in the leg. What the hell is going on in Chicago? These shootings are not random. They are fueled by gang conflicts. There are too many guns on the street, and there is a shortage of values about what is right, what is wrong. In the month of April here in Chicago, 249 people were shot, 189 of them were wounded, and 60 were killed. And according to the crime stats, up to May 1st of 2019, a person is shot every four hours, and a person is murdered every 20 hours on the bloody streets of Chicago. Police-involved shootings are at a first quarter all-time low, seeing only one person killed and one other wounded at the hands of cops. This statistic is the lowest start to any year I have ever recorded. And so far this year, 749 people have been shot, 602 of them have been wounded, and 147 of them have been killed. And in the rankings of the top most violent neighborhoods in Chicago so far for 2019, our number five, South Shore, number four, Humboldt Park, number three, Austin, number two, Garfield Park, and back at number one, Inglewood. I would like to welcome you to the second podcast of Bloody Chicago. There is a serial killer problem we believe happening in Chicago today. Before I start on that, I want to give you a little history of serial killers in Chicago. Now, the Chicagoland area has been home to some of the most prolific serial killers in our nation's history. The origins of serial killers here in Chicago started in the late 1890s with Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, but he was notoriously known as H.H. Holmes. He killed many during the World's Fair in his house of horrors called the Murder Castle. It was located at 63rd and Wallace in the south side neighborhood of Inglewood. Just before he died, he confessed to 27 murders, but it is believed by authorities that he committed about 200 murders. H.H. Holmes was hung on May 7th, 1896. And then there's Richard Speck. Now Speck systematically tortured, raped, and murdered eight student nurses from South Chicago Community Hospital on the night of July 13th into the early morning hours of July 14th, 1966 in the Jeffrey Manor neighborhood. He was convicted and sentenced to death but the death sentence was later overturned due to issues with jury selection at his trial. Speck died of a heart attack after 25 years in Stateville Prison in 1991. I always thought this cockroach deserved the chair, and even more so after that video of him surfaced in 1996, living it up in prison. He was already dead after the video was made public. And then there's John Wayne Gacy, the creepy clown. He killed 33 young men and boys in the Chicago suburb of Des Plaines throughout the 1970s. Gacy brutally sodomized all of his victims while they were handcuffed, and those who resisted were strangled to death and buried in the crawl space under his home. All of these young men and boys were murdered between 1972 and 1978. It was, in fact, the abduction and murder of 15-year-old Robert Peast on December 11, 1978, that ultimately led to Gacy's arrest and the discovery of all the bodies buried beneath his house of horrors. On March 13, 1980, Gacy was sentenced to 21 life sentences and 12 death sentences for the murder of 33 young men. He was transferred to Menard Correctional Center here in Illinois, where he remained for 14 years. And in 1994, he was taken to Stateville Penitentiary for execution. 
He was finally executed by lethal injection on May 10th, 1994. It is believed there were more victims that are still out there from John Wayne Gacy, but most likely will never be found. This next group of serial killers are a rare bunch because these four men participated in the satanic, sadistic murders of 18 women throughout the early 1980s. And the reason I say they're a rare bunch is because the odds of four men sharing the same desires to kill women puts the odds in the hundreds of millions. Robin Geck was the leader of the Ripper crew. Geck once worked for serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Geck and his three followers, Edward Spritzer and brothers Andrew Corellis and Thomas Corellis, drove around the city in a red van looking for prostitutes and any vulnerable women they thought they could kidnap to sacrifice at Geck's apartment. These sadistic bastards removed one breast with piano wire from each of their victims and ate it as Gek read passages from the Satanic Bible. It is also in the record that after serving the breast, they took turns raping the open wound. Then they proceeded to each masturbate into the flesh of the breast, chop it into pieces, and eat it. All four members of the Ripper crew were arrested in 1982 for the stabbing of a teenage prostitute that got away. Geck's associates and other witnesses implicated him in some of the deaths, but investigators never had enough evidence to charge him with murder. Geck is serving a 120-year prison sentence at Menard Correctional Center for mutilating and raping an 18-year-old prostitute. Edward Spritzer and Andrew Corellis were sentenced to death on March 16, 1999. Andrew Corellis was executed by lethal injection at Tams Correctional Center in Southern Illinois for the 1982 strangulation murder of Laureen Borowski, a 21-year-old secretary at a real estate office who had been abducted on her way to work. Her mutilated body was found in a cemetery. Defense attorneys unsuccessfully argued that Andrew Corellis was coerced into confessing. They also argued that the new information cast doubt on the credibility of confessions by two co-defendants who accused him. Andrew Corellis had been sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Rose Davis. He was the first prisoner executed at the new super maximum security prison in Southern Illinois. Thomas Corellis was convicted of Lorraine Borowski's murder and received a life sentence. Edward Spritzer's death sentence was commuted by George Ryan in 2003. Andrew Corellis was Governor Ryan's only execution in 2019, against strong opposition by family members of the victims, Ripper crew member, 58-year-old Thomas Corrales, was released from the Illinois Department of Corrections. He is now living in a halfway house in the west suburb of Aurora. This guy should have never been allowed to see the light of day again. And this is one of those rare cases where evil prevailed. Throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, there were two separate serial killers operating on the south side of Chicago, and between the two of them, they killed 16 women. The first creep, Hubert Geralds Jr., was convicted in 1997 of murdering six women in Chicago's Inglewood neighborhood. His first victim was Rhonda King. Under interrogation by police, he confessed to all six murders. And in 1998, he was sentenced to death. And in 2000, prosecutors moved to vacate the conviction for the King murder because DNA linked her death to the other serial killer, Andre Crawford. 
Gerald's remained on death row for the five other murders. And the last serial killer to be captured in Chicago is Andre Crawford. He was convicted in 2009 for killing 11 women on the south side of Chicago in the late 1990s. Crawford killed 11 women over the course of six years. He strangled, beat, and stabbed them in abandoned buildings. He later returned to have sex with their corpses. Many of the women were prostitutes and drug addicts. DNA linked Crawford to seven of the killings, and later he confessed to all 11. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009. In August of 2017, I was covering a shooting in the Inglewood neighborhood. It was a uh, block party shooting. I think there was three people shot. And I was talking to an older lady, a lifelong resident of Inglewood. And I was talking to her about the shootings and uh, what she thought of it. And she said, these are gangbangers shooting each other. She said, there's a bigger problem here in Chicago that nobody seems to want to uh, acknowledge. And I asked her, I said, well, what is that? She said, there are many of our young women being abducted and killed. And they are being found across the city. This has been going on for many years, she said. Now, I had heard of random murders of women, uh, domestic violence related, and I never really put two and two together. I knew there were rumblings about a lot of women being killed in Chicago, but never seen any urgency. So I kind of slipped back into just covering the shootings. And last month, it all changed when the article in the Sun-Times came out claiming 51 women have been murdered across Chicago and they remain unsolved. Now that means one of two things. Either there are a couple dozen killers still on the loose or there's a serial killer at work here in Chicago. Now, there are two men leading this charge, along with many residents and families of these young women. The first guy sounding the alarm is Bishop Greer. He's from the Freedom First International Foundation. And then there's Thomas Hargrove from the Murder Accountability Project. These two guys are screaming from the rooftops. There is a serial killer loose in Chicago. Over the last 17 years, at least 75 women have been strangled or smothered in Chicago. And their bodies have been dumped in vacant buildings, alleys, garbage cans, and snowbanks. Some were killed with belts, bras, ropes, packing tape, or they just used their bare hands to kill these women. Arrests have been made in only a third of these cases. Now, there are clusters of unsolved strangulations on the south and west sides. Police say they uncovered no evidence of a serial killer at work. If they're right, 51 murderers have gotten away with their crimes. Many of these women struggled with drug addiction, which led them to prostitution, making them vulnerable and particular targets for predators on the street. Some of these women that were killed had no arrest history at all. 25 out of the 75 cases have been closed with the arrests of 13 men. Some of these men were charged with more than one murder. And this leaves 67% of these murders still unsolved. 
There are clusters of strangulations around Washington Park on the south side, Garfield Park on the west side, and 27 of these murders happened in three police districts on the west, south, and far south sides. And these are neighborhoods that have struggled with drugs, gangs, crime, and unrelenting poverty. And these neighborhoods, unfortunately, have become the perfect hunting ground for killers. Just two out of these 27 murders have been solved. Autopsy reports on some of these women indicate they were raped and beaten. Some were gagged. Some had plastic bags tightened around their head. One had a broken nose, and many others suffered severe head injuries and bruises throughout their entire body. And two of these victims, Teresa Bunn and Hazel Lewis, were found dead in burning trash cans within days of each other in November of 2007 in the Washington Park neighborhood. Miss Bunn was eight months pregnant, and at least seven of the 50 victims were found in garbage cans. Now, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, dozens of bodies of women were found, and the Chicago Police Department formed a task force and solved the murders of 40 women. The task force was eventually disbanded, even though the attacks continued at a steady pace. Now let's rewind back to present day. About a month ago, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson said that a task force had been organized between the FBI and CPD to investigate possible links between the deaths of 51 women who have been found murdered across Chicago since 2001. Now, Bishop Greer, I think, lit the fire when he showed up at the police board meeting and claimed there was a serial killer responsible for these killings. There are many young women of color on the far south side and west side that have turned up in garages, alleys, and in garbage cans dead. He claimed there is a serial killer on the loose. Now, following the meeting with Greer, Johnson downplayed Greer's claim. Johnson said the CPD has looked at all these cases and there's nothing to support a serial killer being out there. He said CPD is still waiting for certain evidence to come back and when it does, it may change the status. Now, Thomas Hargrove, I uh, talked about him earlier. He is from the Murder Accountability Project. And he gave a report to Eddie Johnson, Alderman Pat Dowell of the Third, and State Senator Patricia Van Pelt. Now, they held a hearing last month to investigate the state's crime lab's backlog of DNA evidence from hundreds of murder cases. Now, Hargrove claims the death of 51 women who have been found strangled or asphyxiated have characteristics suggestive of serial murder. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Mr. Hargrove's background. He is a retired Washington journalist that founded the Murder Accountability Project in 2015. In 2010, while he was a reporter for the Scripps Howard News Service, he developed a computer code or an algorithm that uses FBI homicide data to identify clusters of murders that pinpoint a high probability of serial killings. That same year, Hargrove identified a pattern of 15 unsolved strangulations of women in northwest Indiana. He says he contacted Gary police officials, but they didn't respond to him. Four years later, in October of 2014, Darren Dion Van 
was arrested at a motel in Hammond where police found a dead woman in a bathtub. Later, Van confessed to the killing and took police to abandoned buildings in Gary where they recovered the bodies of six more women. Now he's serving a life sentence for those seven killings. Hargrove said he believes all seven killings occurred after he presented his analysis to the Gary police in 2010. Hargrove thinks the seven killings could have been prevented if Gary police had acted on his research. He said, who knows, but nothing will happen if you aren't even trying. I found an interview with Hargrove, and here he is, in his own words, explaining what he believes is happening in Chicago. You can go to our website at murderdata.org and you can download the algorithm. We don't keep any secrets. What the algorithm does is it takes the 769,000 murder cases that we've assembled and looks for clusters of similar murders of similar types of people, men or women, according to the way that they were killed, the weapon that was used, and the locality of the murder, usually the county. The uh, algorithm looks for clusters that had an extremely low clearance rate. Our experience is that often that is caused by the presence of a serial killer who has gotten away with his murders. A great many of these killings, about at least three quarters of them, were sexual in nature. Uh, the victim was disrobed or completely nude. There were signs of recent sexual activity. Uh, but the fact that the body recovery sites were all out of doors is extremely unusual for strangulation. Strangulation tends to be a crime of passion, often involving intimates, people who know each other. Uh, these murders all look to be stranger killings happening in uh, uh, places where the body can be disposed and not, and the killer not be observed. Yeah, we don't have access to DNA. Uh, that's m uh, simply a process for police and the FBI. What we do do is take advantage of a public database about homicide called the Supplemental Homicide Report. It's part of the Uniform Crime Report that the FBI puts out every year. The algorithm looks for clusters that deserve a special look, uh, murders that seem to have commonalities and an extremely low clearance rate. And the next step is to start investigating those. Um, we've done that, and so have several uh, news organizations in Chicago. And when you do that, you come away with a very strong feeling that the M.O. Uh, in these murders were astonishingly similar. Oh, yes. Um, I am very confident that these 51 women were not murdered by 51 separate men. Um, the, uh, the, the degree to which the cluster in Chicago is an outlier is dramatic. Uh, you don't see this kind of cluster anywhere else in America. Um, you know, there's always a, a small chance that it could be 51 separate men, but boy, I don't think yeah. so. Yeah. And, and increasingly, increasingly, detectives with the Chicago Police Department are in agreement. They now conclude that any reasonable person would conclude that there's a strong probability of these being connected cases. When Eddie Johnson announced... Uh the FBI and Chicago Police Task Force. A memory popped back into my head, and, you know, it might be something, it might be nothing, but a lot of you that watch Bloody Chicago know that I spend a lot of time in the streets in some of the worst neighborhoods, mostly at night. But this one night, I was coming from a shooting in a... I believe it was in July of 2016. I'm not sure of the day, but I was on a long weekend. It, it might have even been around 4th of July because I think that was a four-day deal. But I was cruising down Halstead coming off of a shooting. And it was about 3.30 in the morning. And I was coming up to 
maybe 58th in Halstead, 60th in Halstead. It was just before the Viaduct. And I seen uh, a guy fighting with this girl on the west side of the street. And I was coming up to a light and there was another car behind me and another car behind him. And I seen this guy fighting with this girl who was up alongside of a building. When I started to get closer, he looked at me, turned, and the guy had this look, you know. Growing up uh, in the environment I grew, grew up in, our neighborhood was mainly outfit, and uh, a lot of these guys were sociopaths, and some were killers. And doing what I do in the streets, I run across a lot of killers. But there's one thing all these killers share, and that's that look in their eyes. If you know that look, you can spot one. And this guy looked at me like he was a killer. I'm not saying he was a serial killer, but you could tell this guy was a killer. And when I glanced over to the woman, now all this happened within about five, six seconds. Actually, two things stood out to me about her. The first thing was, she was a little lady, but she had a wig that was cockeyed on her head, and you could see it was a wig because of that. But she had a look of fear on her face, like uh, she was in trouble. Now, at this time, I was unarmed. Um, yes, three years roaming through these neighborhoods, I did not carry a gun. And I knew she was in trouble and I wanted to stop, but I had this guy on my ass. I made it through the light. And I was trying to look at what was happening behind me out of my rear view mirror. But the guy behind me had his brights on. So evidently one of his headlights were out and he had these brights on and uh, to make them both work. And uh, he was blinding me. So I went down about three, four blocks and I turned down a street, pulled down an alley and came back around. And when I came back, they were gone. You know, I was going to come back, get a better vantage point, call it in if I had to, you know, if I seen she was in distress. Cause like I said, I had no weapon and I had no way to defend myself uh, in the streets at that time. So I noticed that there was a, a truck that was parked along the side and it was an old silver Ford Explorer one of them square shaped ones it was rusty and that was gone too so I wasn't sure you know until I went back the truck was gone and both of them were gone and the reason why I say this is because you just never know if that could have been one of these guys responsible for some of these deaths or he just could have been an abuser with his girlfriend but I felt kind of bad about it because I thought I should have did something about it knowing what I know now prepares me for the next incident where a situation like this arises. You know, you don't go around out there intervening in this type of situations because of the simple fact you're not a policeman. And don't act like a policeman on the streets of Chicago. It'll get you killed. So, next time, um, I would handle it a little differently. Because this... Uh, it's got to stop. And it's going to take people that are out there, whether it's bus drivers or cab drivers or residents or reporters. We've got to keep our eyes peeled because 
worst case scenario, there's a bunch of guys killing these women, different active killers. Because it would be easier to catch one than it would be to catch multiple killers. When I started this project a couple of weeks ago, I uh, started looking at as many of these young women's photos as I could just to see if maybe that young lady was amongst the women killed. But I haven't uh, seen anything as of yet. And I also know that some photos don't exist of these young women. And I have to say that it's hard to remember specific details when it's been almost three years. And hopefully, hopefully she's not one of the uh, many killed by these men or one man. Just don't know and probably never will. What is a serial killer? To me, it's a person that kills multiple times and basically hunts people to satisfy their sick urges. Now, most serial killers carefully choose the ground they hunt on. And normally, it's heavily populated areas in inner city neighborhoods that have a lot of poor and disenfranchised people, heavy drug use, and high crime. And a lot of abandoned buildings where prostitutes take their clients to do drugs and turn tricks. All of these factors are magnets for the men that hunt these women. It is clear to me whoever is doing this has become very comfortable killing women in the hunting grounds of Chicago. The city should have been tearing down these abandoned homes and buildings once they became unoccupied. But why didn't they? One of the biggest problems I found lies within the Chicago Police Detectives Division. Now between 2011 and 2017, clearance rates for non-fatal shootings over a calendar year in Chicago dropped from 15 to 7%. Homicide clearances dropped from 29% to 17%. Why is this? I'm going to tell you. Across the city, the number of detectives who investigated shootings and homicides and all other crime fell from 1,150 detectives in January of 2009 to around 860 in July of 2016. That means CPD is short almost 300 detectives. This data came from the Fraternal Order of Police. Now that tells me the past three police superintendents, Jody Weiss, Gary McCarthy, and Eddie Johnson, have overseen the downsizing of the detectives division. A lot of people are unaware just how overworked and understaffed detectives are during the summer months when the violent shootings go through the roof. It is not unusual for detectives to sometimes be assigned a shooting a day. Why isn't the money being spent to expand the detective division? What kind of message does this send to some of the public? The message it sends is, you can kill in Chicago... And most of the time, get away with it. Before I close this podcast, I have a few more things to say. The 51 unsolved murders are only the ones they have found. And the question is, how many more are out there that haven't been found yet and are just listed as missing? And let's not forget about the pregnant postal worker, Kiara Coles. She up and disappeared on October 1st, 2018 in the Chatham neighborhood. She was due to give birth this past month. Over the years, I noticed there have been a lot of attempted abductions of kids 
and young teens in many of these high crime neighborhoods in Chicago. And just recently, two men in a van were driving around the south side trying to abduct kids. Now they were spotted in many different incidents. And there have been many others out there doing the same thing, targeting kids for abduction. That lady I talked about earlier also told me there is a human trafficking ring operating in these neighborhoods, targeting young girls and in some cases, boys too. And damn near every week there is another girl in the newspaper reported missing. Some are found and some you never hear about again. I noticed our politicians turned our city and state into a sanctuary one. And that's nice. The politicians here in Illinois and Chicago want to try to help the less fortunate. But at what cost? It cost you, the taxpayer, $3.85 billion a year to help these people. But what about our people? What about these girls? Don't they matter more than some third worlder that comes here illegally? How many more detectives could they have hired? And how many buildings could they have torn down? And how many more educational programs, assistance programs, mental health and drug addiction facilities could they have funded with $3.85 billion? And the answer is a lot. But you see, this is more proof that the powers that be, mainly the one-party system Democrats that have run this state since before I was born, and I'm going to tell you, they don't care about us, any of us, that's for sure. I want to leave you with this. These girls and their families deserve to see justice served. And that can't happen without your help. I know somebody knows something. I'm calling on the residents, gang members, and hustlers across Chicago to help find the person or persons responsible for the deaths of these women. Maggio News signing off.